I was super excited, as you know, when the Dune 2 movie came out. I saw it twice, as you know, in theaters, and I was disappointed, to say the least, unfortunately, because I'm a fan of the series. I'm a fan of the novels, right? And so when I see certain characters portrayed in certain ways that weren't up to my perceptions or my imagination of those characters, it it's personal for me. You know, it's, <laughs> I was going to say, it actually was a good movie. Tell me why you're so, so disappointed. <laughs> so I will, I, I will be totally candid. They're, they're good movies. If you're watching them as their own stories, they're good movies. My issue with it is it wasn't my story. It wasn't, it wasn't the Dune that I read. It wasn't the Dune that I had built in my mind. And I think that really portrays the importance of writing. So I was sitting there and for our audience who doesn't know, I have ADHD. So I'm sitting there with my ADHD brain and just ripping into this when I should be working on literally anything else. But I'm just sitting there with my thoughts, right? And I am contemplating the impact of writing and the adaptations of books into movies, right? And I was really also looking at the Hunger Games because I read The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes and I loved it. It was a phenomenal book, one of the greatest books I've ever read. And the movie didn't, the movie was a great movie, but it didn't live up to the, the movie star wasn't power. The it was not the book. Why is that? Why do we get so disappointed when adaptations don't fit our mm. reality? So I was thinking through this and it really occurred to me that when you, when you write, when someone writes a book, they're writing an idea. They're portraying an idea, an image, a character, a picture, imagination. When you read that writing, you're not actually reading. You are writing in your mind an interpretation of that person's mental image, right? So I can read Dune and you can read Dune. And it could say, Paul Atreides is a young, skinny, 15 year old male with curly black hair. And you and I could envision two completely different looking individuals. Yeah, two totally different characters in our mind. Exactly, because we wrote out different ideas based on the prompt given to us. So when you read a book, you're actually writing ideas in your mind and writing things into your imagination. When you watch a movie, you are reading someone else's adaptation. Mm. You're reading what someone else wrote in their you're, mind. You're now visualizing someone else's imagination or exactly. what they wrote and imprinted in their imagination. Exactly. You are reading someone else's thought writing, mm -hmm. so to speak, and you are thereby losing your ability to write your own imagination, to write your own thoughts, to build your own Dune. So for all the people who haven't read the Dune novels, every single one of you enjoyed those the, the the dune movies right i liked it i didn't read the book exactly. i was like cool you've movie never, you have never read it you enjoyed it as you should they're great movies they're great stories on their own but for those of us who have written our sure. own thoughts about dune it is a completely different experience mm -hmm. and i think that really encapsulates the importance of writing that's a really good point what i hear you saying is the Nobody can capture your thoughts, your mind, your imagination, and your unique contributions. So for those who don't know, uh, Dune sets, is set in an, on other planets. And so what I hear you saying is everybody who's read the Dune novels has created other galaxies in their mind. And then yeah. when when you re watch these movies, you're transported. It's like being in Star Trek. You're like, wait a minute. that. That it, this isn't what the planet looks like. These aren't what the characters look like because you ha have created your own worlds in your mind. And that's really what writing is, is mm -hmm. you're creating your own worlds in your mind. You're, you're creating your own ability to contribute to conversations, to contribute to really to humanity, mm -hmm. ideas and concepts and stories and life and memories and experiences that really can shape people's minds and um, ideas and how we interact and how we learn and what happens as a, as a collective society. But if you don't contribute, then we lose your particular individual contribution and nobody can make your individual unique contribution. That's what you're saying, right? Right, that's exactly what I'm saying. And I would just kind of outline for our audience my thinking and thought process here, because some people might say, well, you're, you're just reading someone else's book. You're not actually 
writing anything. So let's look at writing as the grandfather. Writing is you coming up with the original source and you are the, you're the origin, you're the founder and the starter of that source. That's an extremely powerful place to be because the ideas that are flowing from you are completely natural. Mm. Those have a lot of power to influence. When you are reading, you're writing someone else's ideas in your mind, but that doesn't leave you susceptible to them. When you write someone else's ideas in your mind, you can write in your own things. And that's why we have conversations and debates. That's why we analyze arguments is because we now take these source inputs and we kind of like how AI would generate a text prompt. We receive just a little bit and then we build so much more on top of that. Mm -hmm. And so building up that muscle, that ability to analyze ideas, analyze things that other people create and then build upon that and expand upon that, bring your own thoughts, ideas, and values into that, and then also share that with others is so crucial, especially in a country like America where free speech and public forum are fundamental and crucial to our country's success and prosperity. Right, yeah, I really like that. I think writing is really important. I wanna go back to this idea that you asked during our interview about banning books. So there are these ideas that are being banned right now because they're socially unpopular. It's this witch hunt culture that has been perpetuated as like a, a cancel culture. If we decide that we have social fear about an idea, we're going to shut it down. So Dr. Seuss books have been canceled, uh, Huck Finn, Tom Sawyer, other what we would consider mainstream books that once were taught in elementary school, there's other ones that are on the list. But then there's other books that are actually really concerning to society. Like I would say books that really advocate for and groom children for pedophilia that are, you know, are being, are being banned. Is there a line? Where should that line be? I think uh, one, one place that I would say is a really good line to advocate where we stop from um, you know, as we've seen in some really authoritarian cultures, piles of books in a burn, in a burn pile, so that we can all um, align with the authoritarian government in charge that doesn't like ideas that challenge it, which is terrifying because this is our First Amendment. But where do we draw that line with things that like really push pedophilia? Is there's a place where those ideas can be, like in um, certain X-rated or adult bookstores, where you can go in if you want. But we don't put those books in, say, the public library where we have in the kids section, the under 18 section of the public library or in our school libraries where we have kids because we don't want children exposed to ideas that would be considered dangerous for their health. There's a compelling interest in protecting children and their innocence. Um, what would you say to that as someone who's been involved in those discussions from a student leader perspective? I would... First of all, thank you for bringing up the burning of the books occurring in Nazi Germany. I was Something, being really careful about not accusing a single government because multiple governments can engage multiple in Multiple governments that. have done that, but the most prolific example that I can think of in history Absolutely. is Nazi Germany. And what I would really add on to that and warn us to be careful of is such widespread censorship of it. Something that I find interesting is I've looked through a lot of lists of books that people propose should be banned, and I don't think I've ever seen Mein Kampf on the list of books that That's we should be banning. Right? Like, have you ever have you ever heard anyone talk about banning Mein Kampf? So, Dr. Seuss, but not Hitler. That's Dr. fascinating. Isn't that so interesting? So, clearly, the issue is not with the ideas that are being portrayed, and we we touched on that in our interview today. This whole episode has kind of been about you know we should not restrict anyone's ability or rights to create content and share it with others. If you want to seek out that content, if you want to expose your child to that content, you can do that. Let that happen. I would go to, I forgot which Supreme Court justice said it, but he defined obscenity as, I know it when I see it. So when we talk about what should or should not be allowed in a third grade classroom, I know, I know what should or should not be allowed in books in a third grade classroom when I see it. So I think we don't need as a society to totally throw these books out the window, burn them, ban them. We also don't need to allow just anything to be accessible to anyone. There's certain content that absolutely should be restricted to only people who are willingly, intentionally seeking that knowledge. You know, it's a really good point. We do this with movies. 
Exactly. Movies have certain ratings. You can't and, come see this if you're under 18. Right. Yeah. Nor nor do you have the authority to just access it like at, on, on pay-per-view at home. Right. You have to put in codes and stuff in order mm-hmm. to access certain rated movies. It's a good mm-hmm. point. And I think our society is doing a really great job with that. I think so, so many cities, states, counties have started these book advisory boards where just like we talked about in our interview today, the community actually comes together, reads the books, and then decides, okay, what should we or should we not have Mm -hmm. it? So I think a solution would be something along those lines. 